Hello everyone, welcome back to Mathematics for Liberal Arts. Today we begin chapter 15 on graphs, charts, and numbers. And this is kind of an interesting chapter from the standpoint both of the topics we're going to cover, but also its close relationship with chapter 14. Previous chapters, when we moved from one to the next, weren't necessarily very closely linked. Chapter 14 and 15 are. 14 was about why we would be interested in taking samples, what a sample did for us, how it related to a target population, what we could use the sample's information to tell us about the target population. Well, in this chapter, we're going to assume that a sample was already taken from a target population, that somebody has taken measurements of a characteristic from that sample, and now we're trying to take the measurement information and we're trying to represent it somehow so that we can look for trends, that we can look for behaviors, and we can extrapolate eventually from the information we've got about the sample to the target population. It's going to require us to be careful about how we represent the data we get. So we're going to do that a couple of different ways. One way we're going to be doing it is using graphs and charts. Then we're also going to do it numerically in sections 15.2 and 15.3. We're going to try to figure out exactly what is necessary to represent the data that comes from a sample. Uh, basically, how much or how little we need to show in order to actually talk about that data and give people an understanding of what happened with it. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First of all, we have to understand something going in, and that is there's going to be a lot of data coming out of a sample. Most scientific studies, medical studies, they're going to require lots and lots and lots of people in a sample, lots of members to a sample. And that means that if you start taking measurements, you're going to have lots and lots of measurement data coming out of that sample as well. I challenge you to find somebody, anybody, who really wants to be handed a sheet of paper, maybe an Excel sheet with cells just filled with raw data points taken from measurements from a sample. I, I really can't think of anybody on earth who wants to just look at that offhand. Most of the time, there's just too much to look at to be able to make heads or tails of it. So instead, we have to find a way to clarify it. For us, the visual uh, approach to this, showing the data in a way that simplifies the presentation down to lines, to scattered data points, to wedges of a pie chart, to bars and their heights, that's going to be the easiest way to do it. And any time we do use a visual representation of the data, we always call that visual format a graph. Now the book does use some different terms, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with the terms the book uses, but for our purposes here, we may as well just call any visual representation of data a graph. We do have to be careful about some of our terminology, so let's introduce it now. The first is data set. So the idea here is we have a sample, we have measurements from the sample, we're putting all of those measurements, numerical information, in one place together as a collection. We call that a data set. Now some of you may have heard the term set before and may have some ideas of what it means to be a set, so let me clarify right here. A data set is not a set precisely. I'm not going to be too concerned with explaining what a set is overall, but for a data set, data sets are kind of messy. For one thing, they don't have to be in order. So I could have one, two, one, one. Definitely not in order. Another thing is they may allow for repetition of values. Normal sets don't allow for repetitions of values, but data sets do, and it's kind of important that we do that, so that way we represent all of the information we got from a sample. Everything in this data set here is called a data point. That's the next part of our definition. Members of a data set are called data points. And for us, we're going to be most interested in discrete data sets and discrete data. Now, what does that mean? Well, technically speaking, it means this definition here, but I think it is not a stretch to say that this definition is a little bit complicated. It does say exactly what we mean by a discrete data set, but let's try and translate it. 
So when it says here that this symbol, which kind of looks like a V, it's actually the Greek symbol nu, is a minimum value so that if you subtract X and Y one way or the other, that that difference should be greater than or equal to nu. What it's really saying is nu is the minimum distance between data points. And most importantly, nu is the minimum distance for everything in the data set D. So if I take any random data points from D at all, and I look at them, the distance between them has to be either equal to nu or it has to be greater than nu. It cannot possibly be any smaller than nu. That's going to be important for us because basically what that means is when we represent our data, there are going to be gaps between the bits of our data that we're representing. And that's fine. That is absolutely perfect. It actually makes visual representation a little bit easier. You might see visual representations like this. This is just uh, another kind of visual representation of discrete data. To me, just uh, glancing at this, it looks as if the data points that are closest together are probably these two. So if we call this distance right here, this gap, new, this shows pretty clearly that this is a discrete data set because everywhere else we look, this gap right here, that's definitely greater than or equal to new. Ditto here, that is definitely greater than or equal to new. I'm not going to go through everything and point that out, but if you look at these distances, it's easy to see that the distance between these data points has to be at least new. Most of the time, it tends to be greater than new. Can't forget one of my connecting lines. It's also important to note here that these green lines aren't actually there. I want to make sure that is abundantly, abundantly clear here. This is not a connected line. The black points are my data points here. The green lines are just my way of representing the distance. Wouldn't do for you guys to be confused about that. Now, in my opinion, the easiest way to explain how to display data in a graph is to simply build a graph. So let's go ahead and build one. We're going to be given some data. This data is going to come directly from the book. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use that data to build our own chart. It will be a little bit sloppy. It will look a little bit rough. But the point is not to make a perfect graph. It's just to be able to make a graph of some kind. So here we have a table of data. It comes directly from the book, as I mentioned. It's supposed to represent uh, scores from a midterm exam. And I'm going to take a moment to point out that this is discrete data. How do we know this? Well, if you check out this example in the book, I do not remember off the top of my head which example it is in the book, but it's early in section 15.1, that the scores in this table can only be whole numbers. So that means that whenever you look at scores, they're either the same or they differ by, at minimum, one point. That's going to be crucial here because that means that we can represent everything as discrete data. We don't have to worry about weird and ugly representations like we'll see at the end of this section. However, if we're going to try and turn this into some kind of visual representation, in particular, you'll notice here I've talked about a bar graph. That's what we're interested in. It's going to be very difficult to make a bar graph from a presentation this messy. I don't think anybody really wants to try and deal directly with this table. So what we're going to do first is we're going to compress this data. We're going to make it easier to read. And let me go ahead and show you how I'm going to do that, basically. If you look here, the very first score on the table is 12. Well, as I look through this table, I see there are other instances of 12. Uh, here is one, here is another. There's actually a whole bunch of them in this table. Let me go ahead and uh, box all of them. Okay, there we go. So those are all the times that the score 12 appears in the table. It occurs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
9 nine times. Well, rather than showing 12 nine times over like this, why don't we simplify our representation of this information by simply noting in a table that the score 12 appears and it occurs nine times. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do in this little table here. For my own nefarious purposes, I'm going to put 12 right over here. And I'm going to put the number of times it occurs, its frequency, down here. So this table right now says the score 12 occurs nine times in the table, or 12 occurs nine times in our data set. All right. Now let's go back. Let's do a different one. Um, oh, the next one underneath that is 16. Let's go ahead and change color really quickly. I'm thinking red this time. Okay, well, how many times does 16 appear in this table? Well, there's one. And, um... Well, actually, I don't see any other occurrences of 16 whatsoever. You can double check if you would like, but it appears that 16 only occurs once. Okay, so if I come back here, again, for my own nefarious purposes, switching back to uh, green for right now, it looks like I can put 16, say, right here, and 16 only occurs once. Let's go ahead and do this for the rest of the table. Remember, we're going to be looking back at this, so feel free to look through here and actually build this table yourself, like what I'm doing. We always choose a value, we box it like I've done, and then look for all, all the other occurrences of that value so that we can record in these tables on this page here, the score itself, and then underneath it, the number of times that score occurs. There we go. These are all of the unique scores. Sometimes we call them distinct scores, kind of like we've used the term distinct before. So these are all of the distinct scores that we saw on that table before, and underneath is the number of times all of them appear. Now what we're going to do is we're going to treat each score as a horizontal value, as an x value, in other words. And then we're going to treat the frequency for each of these scores as a vertical value, a y value. Now, why am I doing this thing? Well, the reason why is because I want to be able to represent this data using a two-dimensional graph or chart. It's going to look a little bit similar in some ways to things that we've done before in algebra. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to place each of these scores on the horizontal line, the x-axis. Then, over top of each one of these scores, I'm going to draw a height. The height will be exactly the same as the frequency for each of these scores. And then, from that height, I'm going to draw a rectangle that stretches from the height down all the way to the x-axis, making a bar which is why we're going to call this a bar graph. Let me show you what I mean. I have right here a score of 1, and 1 has a frequency of 1. Might as well point at it here. So, going to my table on the next page, I find the score of 1 placed on the horizontal axis, the x-axis. And let me see, I better go ahead and have a thinner line to work with here, so I'll have room. I'm going to find a height of 1. Now, height of 1's got to be somewhere around here, halfway between the x-axis and 2. So I guess I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, right about here. And like I said a moment ago, I'm going to draw that line at the height. Ooh, maybe just a little bit too high. I'm going to draw a line at the height and then I'm going to connect it down in a bar. And then I'm going to also fill it in a little bit. Okay, so far so good. We've represented the fact that the score 1 occurs in our data set once, visually. Okay, now let's go back. The next score is 6, and it occurs once. So over here is 6. Once again, we're going to do a height of 1, so that looks like basically so. 
that may still be just a little bit too high. I did mention, I think, that this is going to be a little bit rough, and that's okay. We're not looking for perfection, we're just looking for a good representation by hand. And then after that comes seven, two times. Okay, so here's seven, here's two, more or less. And there we go. So now we can already see the first three scores from our table, from our original data, represented visually. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the others. I definitely recommend that you, if you have interest in practicing with me, and that is a good practice in general, pause the video so that you can look at these scores, then go back and fill out your own bar graph just like what I'm doing. You may even be able to print out the PDF I have so that that way you could go ahead and fill it in using exactly the same X, Y axes that I'm using. And there it is in all its glory, the visual representation of our data. If you look at every single one of these scores, every single one of these numbers on the horizontal axis, and then check out its height, the height of each score is the number of times it occurs in our table. I want to make sure I repeat that multiple times. I know it's probably sounding like a broken record, but it's important to know how we made this table. And we may as well label this. A lot of times when you have a bar graph, you label what the axes mean. So what you can do is you can say, okay, this is test scores. And then the vertical axis might just be, um, we'll say frequency. Now, what I'd like to do really quickly is flash in front of your eyes another bar graph. Definitely looks a little bit smoother than the one we just drew, but that's not really my point. Look at this bar graph. Look at the one we had a second ago. What do you notice about them? Well, at first, apart from obvious small differences like things in color and so on, it doesn't necessarily appear like these are the same bar graph at all. I think I may have just given the game away of saying that, but it doesn't really look like these are the same. It looks like they're representing different things. But let's pay some close uh, attention to this. If you look at the scores 1, 16, and 24, you should notice here in our bar graph that each of them has a frequency of 1. Well, looking back at this bar graph, the scores 1, 16 and 24 all have a frequency of 1. Yes, the bar is higher, but the frequency label is the same. Interesting. And actually, if you start going through, you're going to find out little bit by little bit as you go through that these frequencies that are being represented here, even though they look different, are exactly the same as the frequencies here. The reason for this is simple. The data here in this uh, bar graph and the, table in, uh, the data here in this bar graph came from exactly the same table. These are the same data being represented by two different bar graphs. You wouldn't have known that just looking at it, though. Now, it's important to understand here what's happened. We've actually done a couple of things. First thing we've done is we've started the bar graph much higher. The values start way, way up here instead of down here. The second thing is, there's a major difference between the gaps between 1 and 8, 8 and 16, on the one hand, and the gap between 0 and 1, which means our scale is a little bit skewed. Doing that gave us a completely different visual impression of the data. Now was that intentional? Was that unintentional? It's hard to say. But it does mean that when we look at these two different bar graphs, we get a very different impression of the data that we're looking at. And I've tried to capture that here in this little fact here. We can very easily skew data and perception of data in a bar graph or through really any graph if we do the right type of changes. For us in particular with bar graphs, changes in scale, translated starts, in other words meaning starting way up here as opposed to down here, 
and noisy presentations, meaning uh, presentations that have many, many, many points of data being represented all at the same time with flashy graphics and other things that kind of obscure the, the data that you're trying to show. All of these things easily change our perception of what's going on with the data. And even worse, even though it does really, in many ways, misrepresent the data, it's not actually showing us wrong data. Let me show you what I mean. Even though this bar graph right here is maybe a little bit skewed compared to ours, the fact of the matter is it still is showing correct data. The only thing that's really been changed is our perception of it. As per usual when it comes to people, people are the weak point of basically any system, and that's what these sort of changes do. Whether or not somebody meant to misrepresent the data, the fact of the matter is that misrepresenting the data through any of these techniques and probably a host of others as well is a really easy way of changing how we perceive the data and we can make decisions then based off of maybe a perception that isn't quite right. It's important that we understand that, important that we immediately, whenever we see noisy data, or noisy representations of data, uh, representations that use weird scales, that use translated starts and stops, that we take that data and we declutter it, that we change the scale, that we look at it in different ways and make sure that we're not being unduly influenced by the visual representation. We can actually also make a line graph for this data. Now I'm not going to build it here for you, but I'm going to show you instead what it looks like. Here it is, right here in front of us. Now it's important to note this representation, that representation, and this representation are all talking about the same table of data that we had before. They are all coming down to exactly this table. Every single one of them is a slightly different way to represent it. And the important thing to understand here for these line graphs is we start out building what looks like a scatter plot. We do exactly the same x value, y value representation. Each score is an x value. Its frequency in the table is a y value. We place all of those dots where the x and y values should be and then we connect them using a line. Here's another type of representation of data via a chart that we're going to be doing. This is going to be a pie chart. What we need to do in this is actually find angles. See, the way that a pie chart represents information, and as I'm sure you guys have seen in your lives, is every single one of these activities is going to represent a chunk of the circle, a pie wedge. Well, the pie wedges are described by the angle that goes between the two outermost edges of the wedges. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and find that angle. How do we do that? Well, actually it's pretty simple. We can see that every single one of these scores here, the average hours for each of these activities, is a chunk of the total amount, 24 hours. What we can do is we can take this chunk of hours, say for sleep, 8.7, we can divide it by 24 to figure out what percentage of the 24 hours this represents, and then we'll take that percentage and multiply it by 360 degrees. What we'll get out of it will be a percentage of 360 degrees. It will be an angle, and that angle will be the angle that we're interested in. So, entering this information to my calculator, 8.7 divided by 24, then multiply by 360 gives 130.5 degrees. If we do it again over here with leisure and sports, it would be 4.1 divided by 24 times 360. And if we feed that into our calculator, we get 61.5 degrees. All right, let's finish the rest of this table. Just bear in mind, every single one of these calculations I do is going to be exactly the same.
there we are. Now you'll notice that if we tally up all of these uh, angles that we've got, if we add them all together, 130.5 plus 61.5 plus, etc., all the way down, they're going to total to 360 degrees. So this is telling us if we take wedges of the circle, and the wedges are described by these angles, put them all together, it'll give us a full circle, and each of these wedges will represent the number of hours. Now I'm not going to ask you guys to do that as a part of this course. I'll ask you to find the measure of the angles. Making the charts is a little hard, so instead I'm going to show you what it should look like. Every single one of these wedges has the number of hours on average listed next to it. And also to help you remember exactly what we're doing here, let me go ahead and rewrite this formula. And on top of rewriting the formula, I'm also going to box it up for you. This is the formula we use every single time. Okay, now for the very last part of this, and we'll close our video out, we've been talking about discrete data. Remember, discrete data is data that has a minimum distance between the points. So the question is, could there be other types of data? And yeah, there is. There's something called continuous data. Our very helpful definition here says that continuous data is data that is not discrete. Now that sounds a little bit mm, less than ideal as far as definitions go. Technically useful, but practically not very useful. But let's think about this for a second. What this is saying is, whereas discrete data has a minimum distance between points, in continuous data there isn't a minimum distance between points points can be really, really close together and get closer and closer and closer together over time. Eventually, some of this data, maybe not all of it, but some of it may have no gaps in between it for us to look at. In fact, instead of talking about it, let's go ahead and look at it real quick. Let's see if I can navigate our way back to the original slide. Ah. Here we go. So this was our example of discrete data connected by these little green lines to represent distance. So now, let's instead look at some continuous data. The red line represents continuous data. You see there are no gaps in between the data points. This is much more representative of where discrete data eventually goes if we take larger and larger of samples and more and more accurate representations of a target population. But for our course, we're not going to be interested in this. Also, that is going to be it for this particular section. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in section 15.2. Bye.